Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. As the Word of God in today's Vespers invites us to rejoice, and we rejoice because the Church celebrates your generosity. I welcome you to this cathedral on the second Sunday of Advent to pray this even song and to bestow the Chevrolet Medal Award on more than a hundred of our brothers and sisters whose tireless and selfless service in this archdiocese have contributed so much to the building up of the body of Christ. Today we celebrate the generosity and spirit of sacrifice that has inspired so many years of faithful service. Today we honor a cross section of men and women from all over the archdiocese, from every linguistic and ethnic group whose years of service rendered with great humility and out of the limelight redound to the good of the whole church. Without you, the apostolic endeavors, the good works of mercy, the educational programs, and so many grace-filled activities that fuel the life of our archdiocese would come to a grinding halt. Your loving service is born of a deep faith and a sense of discipleship that today we want to recognize and hold up as a role model for our young Catholics. Your names have surfaced through consultations with pastors, parish councils, regional bishops, and others. Your service has made a difference. And today we simply want to say thank you to God for giving us such brothers and sisters in the household of the faith. And we want to say thank you to you and your families for the many hours of generous service that you have given in our parishes, our schools, our diocesan agencies, serving the poor in soup kitchens and prisons, passing on the faith through programs of evangelization and myriad works of mercy. It's so humbling to realize how many outstanding parishioners we have whose dedication and loyalty to Christ and his church is a constant source of blessing and richness to us. So often we take you for granted, but today at least, like the Samaritan leper, we return to cast ourselves at Jesus' feet, glorifying and thanking him for giving us such brothers and sisters whose witness and good example fill us all with hope and joy. This year our Chevrolet Medal celebration takes place just after Thanksgiving, very fittingly, and at the beginning of Advent, a season of hope and expectation. And your goodness is a source of our hope. One of the first Advent figures to emerge in the season is always John the Baptist, calling us to an ongoing conversion. Indeed, our life of discipleship begins with our baptism, by which we are incorporated into Christ and become connected to the Lord and to one another with bonds that can never be broken. The diocesan award is named for our first bishop, a man who was exiled from his native France after the French Revolution, having been imprisoned for not swearing an oath that would have compromised his priestly vocation. God's providence brought him here to Boston, where he labored tirelessly with the immigrant Catholics and the Native Americans who made up the church family. The entire Catholic population of New England in those days could have fit into this cathedral. Today, we are two million strong in the Archdiocese of Boston, not counting the other dioceses of New England. 
We have been the beneficiaries of all those who have gone before us, marked with the sign of faith. This beautiful cathedral built by poor immigrant Catholics 150 years ago stands as a monument to their lives of faith. We need to preserve the treasure of the faith and pass it on to future generations. Our brothers and sisters receiving the Chevrolet Medal today are doing just that. Bishop Chevrolet's Episcopal motto, something each bishop has on our coat of arms, was Diligamus nost in vicem, which means let us love one another. The words remind us of that refrain in the writings of St. John that echo the new commandment that Jesus gives us as he washed the feet of his first disciples, recorded at the end of John's Gospel, where Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I love you. St. John, called the beloved disciple, wrote that last gospel, and that refrain comes up constantly in his epistles. At the end of his life, St. John himself was in exile, living on the island of Patmos. He lived in a cave, and each Sunday, the faithful would carry him down to the city so that he could preach at the Sunday Eucharist. And each Sunday, St. John the Apostle would give the same sermon. I'm sure that this would be very disconcerting to a lot of people, but if your pastor is St. John, you're not going to complain, I guess. But finally, someone got up enough courage to say, John, why are you always preaching the same sermon? And you know what St. John told them? He said, I simply repeat what I heard Jesus saying over and over and over again when he walked with us in Galilee. Love one another. This is the beautiful motto of Bishop Chevres. It's a challenge for all of us to live a life of discipleship, but it's this love that we have for our brothers and sisters in the church that is a sign of hope and an invitation to others to follow the Lord. I often share with people that once I was greeting people at the door of the church and a father appeared with this small child and he said to the child, do you know who this is? Pointing to me. Now, I was waiting for the usual Santa Claus response, <laughs> but the kid said, this is the communion guy. So often children think that I'm Santa Claus and I always tell them, you know, that they shouldn't be disappointed because although I'm not Santa Claus, I am a bishop and Santa Claus himself was a bishop. The day after tomorrow is another great Advent feast, the feast of St. Nicholas, Santa Claus. Being an Irish infiltrator in a German seminary, I learned a lot about St. Nicholas and how important he is as a figure of Advent. In the seminary, it was the day we gathered for gift givings and put up the Christmas trees and sang the, the Christmas carols in German. St. Nicholas is such an important figure of Christmas. Pope Benedict, himself a German, who I'm sure had many St. Nicholas celebrations, once said that St. Nicholas is so significant because in the history of the church, he's the very first saint to be canonized who was not a martyr. In the first three centuries of the church, people who were venerated for sanctity were either figures from the gospel stories or those early martyrs who laid down their life in witness to the church's faith in the resurrection. But in the person of St. Nicholas, people recognized another way to witness to the church's faith. His service, his charity, his goodness, his kindness, his concern for the poor, his compassion. 
they said, this is just as compelling as those martyrs who died in the Colosseum. And so he was raised to sainthood in the church. One of the interesting facts of St. Nicholas's life is that he was one of the bishops at the Council of Nicaea in 325 that wrote the Nicene Creed that we pray every Sunday at Mass. But for Nicholas, it wasn't just a list of doctrines. It was a beautiful exposition of God's love for us, of the history of salvation, a God who loves us so much that he sent his only beloved son into the world. And it was that faith in God's love, that faith in the incarnation, the word made flesh, that transformed Nicholas into that kind of a disciple whose life was a constant witness to God's loving presence among us. So I urge you every Sunday when you're praying the creed, remember it's Santa Claus's prayer, but it's also our story. At Christmas, we look at the crash and the Christmas cards. They're pictures taken from our family album. It's there that we discover who we are as Jesus' followers. It's there that we discover why we're here in this world and what we have to do with our lives. We see the fraternal love and the concern in the life of Nicholas and in the life of Bishop Chevreus. Their love for all serves as a reflection for the love of Christ and a witness to the transformative power of the Christian faith. Advent is also a time as a church when we commit ourselves to hospitality in the Gospels. During Advent, it was an old Irish custom to put a candle in the window as a sign to the Holy Family that there would be room in this home for Mary and Joseph. The Spanish people have a similar custom, a novena of Advent called the Posadas, where they relive Mary and Joseph looking for a place so that Jesus can be born. And it's almost like our caroling. They go from house to house singing these songs, asking for lodging, asking for posada, as it's said in Spanish. In the songs, we'll see it's Mary and Joseph. We're looking for a place to stay. And the people inside sing back, go away, there's no room. And then Mary and Joseph said, but we're looking a place for Jesus to be born. And the people say, well, why didn't you say so? Come on in and we'll have a party. They're changing the history. At Bethlehem, there was no room at the inn. But in Advent, we're invited to change that history, to make room in our hearts, in our lives, for Jesus who comes in the humility of a little child, for Jesus who comes into our lives in the form of a person who is suffering, a person who is sick, a person who is homeless. Advent is such an important time for the church because it's a spiritual preparation for Christmas so that we can rescue Christmas from being just a sentimental and materialistic secular celebration. I often share with people that when I was a young priest, I used to have weddings every Saturday in the cathedral in Washington. My parishioners were all from Latin America and they were not the most punctual people. And one Saturday, it was during December, I remember waiting so long and wondering when this wedding was going to be. And finally, the bride appeared in the door of the sacristy. She looked lovely in her white dress and her veil, but I could see she'd been crying. And I said, what's the matter? She said, Padre, it's not going to be any wedding. She said, my fiance is in Buffalo, New York, and they have six feet of snow. So would you please go and tell the people in the congregation that they should go directly to the reception. 
So I went to the pulpit. I announced that there would be no wedding and it was a gasp. And then I said, but you're supposed to go right to the restaurant for the party. And they all trotted off very happily. Well, that night I was thinking about this and I thought, well, that, that's like a parable of what Christmas has become. We have the lights and the music and the presents and the decorations and the bridegroom is in Buffalo. Advent is about bringing him home, putting Christ at the center of our lives, the center of our history. Let us all work together to live this Advent as a time of spiritual renewal and of hospitality, hospitality to receive our brothers and sisters, hospitality to receive Christ into our hearts so that we will show ourselves to be a welcoming people of love and service. As Bishop Chevres urged us so many years ago, diligamos nos invicem, let us love one another.